Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. And my guest today kind of became a star all over the world last year, but had been a prominent man uh, in British public life for many, many years. John Burko stepped down after 10 years, a speaker of the House of Commons at the end of last year, and he's hugely famous in America now, and um, his, uh, his, his version of order is obviously shouted at him all around the world. Um, but you're, you've also made a huge political journey, really, from being a right-wing conservative to a man regarded as probably sympathetic to the Labour Party, could have defected and, and, and became Speaker instead. How good a shape do you think British democracy is in right now? How worried are you? I think it could be in a lot better shape than it is. Uh, that's not a commentary on any one particular political party. I think that the difficulties that we face have substantially been spawned and certainly exacerbated by the huge ructions, the divisions and the lingering bitterness over Brexit. That's not going to dissipate overnight or even necessarily very quickly. But I hope if there is a mindset across the political parties that says, let's try to bring people together and where we disagree, let's try to disagree agreeably, that will probably hasten the process of reconciliation. But I think part of the difficulty is this resurgent populism which is a phenomenon not just in the UK but in other parts of Europe and in the United States. An idea really of simple answers, Krishnan, to often quite complex and multifaceted questions. That's one part of the difficulty of our democracy. And the other, I suppose, in the UK is a consequence of the democratic process. And in our system, there's nothing new about this. It's not Boris Johnson's fault. It's not an indictment of him as prime minister or of any particular political party. But the other problem is that if you have a government with a very large majority, because we have a winner-takes-all system, the opportunities for the opposition are far fewer. And the scope for parliamentary assertiveness, which I happen to think is a very important part of a functioning pluralist democracy, the scope for parliamentary assertiveness is much reduced. But how, how fundamentally worried about Britain and stability are you? I mean, you mentioned the threat of populism. We now have a, a, a big majority under this government. I mean, are these things that you just see as sort of challenges as part of the normal up and down of British politics? Or is there any particular threat to British democracy at the moment, do you think? Well, as I say, I think that the tendency of people to think that there are simple solutions to complex problems is something of a challenge. And I think that if I talk about populism, I would say that it's a great thing, a democratic, egalitarian, enabling thing, that people who are not elected and don't occupy positions of authority and don't work in the media can express their views on social networking sites. So I think that social media in that sense are a good thing. Where they cease to be quite such a good thing and are challenging for a democratic system is when people think that it is quite impossible for anyone to hold a view legitimately that differs from their own. And I think in recent years, there has been a burgeoning phenomenon of ad hominem abuse, abuse of democratic legislatures, abuse in particular of women, abuse of ethnic minority parliamentarians and so on. And those are problems, but they're not attributable to one party or another or to one prime minister or another. And therefore, they shouldn't be the stuff of partisan attack. If you are asking me, do I think there are some problems which afflict our democracy and about which we ought to have an adult conversation? I think that there are. And one of them is the rise in frankly, vulgar abuse 
on the internet. I thought myself, sitting in the Speaker's chair during the Brexit debates, that the way in which some of the principled minority voices on the Remainer side were abused, rubbished, vilified, intimidated and threatened was intolerable. I mean, that, that sort of appalling attitude towards other people kind of really bled into parliamentary debate um, around the resumption of Parliament after the unlawful prorogation. Now, that's, that's where you begin your book. Your autobiography, Unspeakable, actually begins with um, not a prologue, but a prorogue, um, in which you talk about that. And it, uh, were you shocked at the language that was being used? I was disappointed, but let's try to keep this in perspective, Krishnan. I was disappointed, and I say in that prorogue or prorogue chapter at the start of the book that there was a very toxic atmosphere when Parliament came back in the latter part of September, and I'd never known quite such a high-octane, toxic, and at times abusive atmosphere. But I don't want it to be thought, and I'm not arguing, that that was in any sense the norm. Most of the time, that has not been the case in Parliament. Most of the time, indeed, even in the previous two or three years, it was not the case. And I was Speaker from 2009 to 2019 for 10 years and four months. And for the bulk of the time that I sat in the chair, debates were characterised by robust, but on the whole, respectful disagreement. And I'm a big fan of my colleagues. I think the Brexit fatigue which afflicted the country also afflicted the House. And when people said, well, the House was divided, that reflected the divisions in the country. And when I talk about fatigue, I suppose what I mean is that just as there were people in the country getting fed up with it, there were colleagues, in a sense, almost tiring of repeating the same points over and over and over again. But if their opponents were going to do so, they had to do so. There was an inevitability about it, but I think probably because of the sheer intensity and concentrated focus on the Brexit issue over such a long period, people became frazzled. They sometimes were irascible towards each other. There was, on occasion, a less respectful and tolerant atmosphere than had hitherto obtained. But measured over the 10 years, I would say Parliament operated very successfully. And I would myself argue, Krishnan, against those who contend the opposite, that from 2016, Parliament did its job. There is a narrative out there, very popular, of course, in parts of the newspapers, that it was a useless Parliament, that it was a rotten Parliament, that it was an illegitimate Parliament. And one or two senior ministers even saying, this parliament is a disgrace, this parliament has no moral right to sin. I don't agree with any of that. I think that the last parliament was actually a good parliament. Yes, it was undecided, and the issue of Brexit in that parliament was unresolved, but that was because the way genuine, strongly held and irreconcilable differences of opinion in Parliament as there were in the country. And the Parliament didn't just appear from nowhere. That Parliament was elected in June 2017, almost a year after the EU referendum. And it had a duty to question, to probe, to scrutinise, to challenge the government of the day across the field of public policy, and most notably, of course, in its pursuit of Brexit. And it did so. And the idea that it was under some sort of bounden duty just to vote through the Brexit legislation and deal proposed to Parliament by the Theresa May government is quite wrong. So my overall point is the last Parliament was a good Parliament. I celebrate my parliamentary colleagues. And measured over a decade, I think Parliament was more lively, more interesting, more dynamic, more urgent more unpredictable and more challenging towards the executive branch than had previously been the case. And it is at least part of the responsibility of the Speaker to champion Parliament acting as scrutineer 
of the executive. That's what I sought to do. Am I proud of the fact that we got through a lot more questions during my time at question time sessions than in the past? I am. Am I proud of the fact that I granted hundreds of urgent questions to colleagues so that they could question government ministers? I am. Am I proud of granting time for emergency debates in a way that wasn't previously fashionable and didn't on any significant level happen? I am. I wasn't supporting the government and I wasn't supporting the opposition. I was supporting Parliament and that won me a lot of friends and it also made me a lot of enemies and I'm completely relaxed and sanguine about that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that but let, let's, let's wind back to the beginning. I mean we, we do this interview through the prism of changing the world. When did you first want to change the world? I'd like to say that I wanted to change the world when I first came into politics. If I'm really brutally honest with you, Krishnan, I don't think I did. I think in a very general sense, I wanted good policies to be pursued and I wanted the best for my country. But when I first became interested in politics, I was a conservative. So I wasn't mainly interested in changing the world. I was mainly interested in keeping the best of what was already there. Now, admittedly, the period of the Thatcher government did bring about transformational change, and I was a supporter of that. But I don't think I sort of woke up in the morning and said to myself, John, you've got to play your part in changing the world. And secondly, and I absolutely admit this, lots of people say, oh, I came into politics to make the world a better place, and a lot of people probably do. The truth is that when I first aspired to come into politics, I wanted to serve the cause of number one. I wanted to advance my own prospects. I was an ambitious young chap in a hurry, and I don't think I really had a deep mission to change the country or the world, making them a better place. I had a generalized commitment to the public good, and I had a very keen preoccupation with trying to advance the prospects of Jay Burko. Now, you I mean, might that, say... That's very candid and, and, it is and candid, very refreshing. It happens to I mean, be true. It well, happens to be true. And I'm not going suspects. to lie and pretend that, you know, I've got some great idealistic commitment. I think, actually, my journey is a very unusual and atypical journey. So many people go from left to right, whereas I've gone from right towards the left, landing in the centre. I didn't want to be a member of another political party, but... You know, I had long since, I have long since ceased to espouse conservative views. I definitely moved leftwards, there's no dispute about that. And I have become a lot more idealistic and progressive and preoccupied with social justice and the evil of global poverty and the need to reduce inequality than I ever was as a young person. Because who you really are, um, I, I find fascinating because... Uh you know, you're one of the most famous public figures in Britain, partly because of Brexit, partly because of Prime Minister's questions, which is watched all over the world. Um, and I think most people, to see you and hear you, would think you were, you know, this sort of posh public school boy, pillar of the establishment, you know, um, the usual. And you're, you're, you're not. You know, you're well, Jewish for a start, um, pretty sort of lower middle class, stroke working yeah, class yeah, yeah. background. Um, not at all easy, comprehensive school, University of Essex. I mean, are you, to what extent are you a sort of a, have you deliberately projected an image of yourself that is posher than you are? No, oh no, no, I haven't done that. I mean, I've no recollection of having elocution lessons in my youth. I can't absolutely swear that I didn't, but I've absolutely no recollection of doing so. I'd probably have to ask members of my family, but I'm pretty certain I didn't. My father ran a small business determinedly but not very successfully for many years and partly through ill health spent the last 10 years of his working life driving a minicab my mother was a legal secretary for many years and she herself comes from a working class background dad came from a working class background we enjoyed very very modest prosperity in the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s but we were certainly never I think more than lower middle class no, I think I probably inherit my father's speaking style. My father tended to speak in paragraphs. He strongly deprecated the split infinitive and the use of the preposition at the end of a sentence. He always thought that was very wrong. So I think I've just inherited Dad's speaking style. I know some people find it very annoying and other people like it. All I can say to you, Krishnan, is that 
I'm authentic. There's nothing contrived about it. I haven't set out to be posher than I am, and I haven't set out to misrepresent my background and to make it less posh, and I'm a pretty ordinary bloke. So did you inherit your father's politics as well? Is that why you started off on the right? Yes. Because you talk about your conversations with him. Yes. You know, and you talk about him as an admirer of Enoch Powell, mm. talking about immigration and all mm. those sorts of things. Mm. He was basically sort of a right-wing Tory. He was. I hadn't previously been interested in politics. I'd been very committed to sport. I was a junior tennis competitor and so on. But really, from the winter of discontent when the streets went unswept, the sick went untended and the dead went unburied, it was a terrible winter of discontent, I started to focus on politics. And my teachers were split between supporters of the Callaghan government, and this was in Finchley, in Margaret Thatcher's constituency, and Benite critics of it, but none of them, as far as I could tell, was a conservative. I thought that this was no way to run a country. The UK had become largely ungovernable. Uh, the unions exerted far too much sway. And I started to talk about these things with Dad, and he rather reinforced that view and had very strong views about all of those issues, about the running of the economy, the power of the unions, the importance of the private sector for the creation of wealth. Now, you'll say all of that is fairly workaday and unexceptionable stuff. What was really significant, I suppose, and bad for me, and bad for me, I took the wrong course and made a very foolish decision, was that I listened to what Dad said about Enoch Powell. And what did he say? Well, he said he thought Powell was a much maligned man, and that he was hugely bright and a brilliant speaker, and that he'd made a very honest analysis of the problems of New Commonwealth and Pakistani immigration. Bizarre, as I say in the book, absolutely bizarre and appalling. For this Jewish man. That this Jewish man should hold such views. Dad genuinely felt, I'm not here to defend my dad. My father passed away 33 years ago, and he's not on trial, and he's not being interviewed. But he thought that New Commonwealth and Pakistani immigration had been less successful than Jewish immigration, and he thought that the number of migrants coming to the UK represented a big problem, and he admired Powell. And I, with that sort of intensity of youth, thought, ooh, let's study this person. And I was attracted, and I stupidly, crassly, perhaps unforgivably, joined the right-wing Conservative Monday Club, which was operating on the fringes of the Conservative Party. It was pro-repatriation and, pro and all those sorts of things. repatriation of immigrants, and I got involved in that committee and was secretary of it for a period. And then what happened was that my political activism collided with personal experience. I met people, frankly, who were anti-Semitic and who didn't necessarily know that I was Jewish, but made anti-Semitic remarks. And, and then suddenly, in a kind of blinding revelation, I thought, this is really very, very, very unsavory, unattractive and unacceptable. So do you think you were a bit of a racist in those days? I didn't think of myself in those terms. I wouldn't have expressed it like that. But there is no doubt that the group that I joined was racist and I was associating with racists, and I was signing up to positions that were racist. Do I so when you look at 20-year-old John Burko... I'm absolutely horrified. Do I think he, that I've got a racist bone in my body today? Of course not. No, but, but, but then... Did I associate with racists, and was I effectively guilty of promoting or encouraging racism? The truth is, I guess I was, and that's outrageous and... Disgraceful. If I look back at the 20-year-old John Burko and the views that I espoused at that time and the, the minutes I took, I think, of immigration, repatriation and race relations industry subcommittee meetings of the Monday Club, I'm deeply ashamed. It's the worst thing I've ever done in my life. The only plea in mitigation that I can offer, although I hope people think it is quite a considerable plea in mitigation, is that I was 18 when I joined 20 when I ceased to be active, and 21 when I formally resigned in February 1984. Now, that is 36 years ago. I was 21 when I left. I'm 57 today, and I think I've got quite a track record over a period of several years of supporting racial equality and gender equality and 
LGBT equality and the rest. So yes, I was terribly, terribly, terribly wrong, and I deserve to be criticised for that part of my career, and I've been very open about it in the book. But if you believe in the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, presumably you'd be inclined to forgive me. But does it give you a way into understanding racism, prejudice, and all the things that are current as well? Because, you know, as you say, when, when, when people are young and foolish, they're young and foolish. But do you understand why it took somebody to say anti-Semitic things to you, for you to see the wrong in the racism that you hadn't seen before? Because it, it shouldn't have. You kind of go, well, that's a bit dim, isn't it? I know. Why, I know. Why, I know. why I did it very, take that? I know. <laughs> I was very slow-witted and dim about it. It shouldn't have taken that clash with my personal background to render obvious what should have been obvious anyway. So do you, do you, do you understand why? I mean, do you think you had been sort of effectively indoctrinated by your dad, or, or was it you? Well, ultimately, you have to take responsibility yourself. I certainly wouldn't say that I was indoctrinated by my dad. I think I wrongly and stupidly allowed myself to fall prey to a powerful speaker and writer. But, of course, oratory is value-neutral. It's a gift or a skill, maybe partly natural, partly acquired and honed and nurtured and cultivated and practised, but it is morally neutral. It can be used for good by, for example, Martin Luther King, or it can be used for evil for example, and most notably in human history, by Hitler. And I should never have fallen under the sway of Paulite thinking. And I can't quite explain why I did, other than that... I think the... rigour of his thinking, and the slight sense also that he was in his party, an outsider fighting the establishment seemed to appeal to me. Now, it was a very misguided view on my part. People fighting the establishment may be fighting the establishment for good reason and for a good cause, or they may be fighting against the establishment for no very good reason and for no very good cause. And looking back now, I didn't think so then, but looking back now, Ted Heath was absolutely right to sack Enoch Powell from the Shadow Cabinet. Now, at the time, I thought, poor Powell, the victim of Heath's brutality and lack of consideration and insistence on sticking to a misguided consensus on immigration. To me, at the time, Powell was the victim, and that was very much the attitude on the Tory right. Here was this truth-teller who was bravely standing up to the forces of the Tory and Labour establishments. Well, establishments can be wrong, but they can also be right. And actually, the general view was right, that what he was doing was profoundly dangerous and damaging to the prospect of decent race relations in this country, and really something of an abuse of the position of a major public figure who had the opportunity to get his voice heard and his messages listened to by people across the country. Did it fan the flames of racism? I think it undoubtedly did, and I think there was evidence subsequently that there was an increase in the incidence of racial attacks, and I think politicians do have a very, very solemn responsibility to use language carefully, to treat issues sensitively, whereas, of course, that speech and others were incendiary devices, and he knew they were. Do you think you've been a victim of snobbery? Oh, yes. I mean, snobbery is very much a phenomenon in British society. I remember being very amused to be told on one occasion by a friend of mine that a Conservative member had said to him, well, when the Labour Party have the Speaker, we sort of rather expect that it will be a working-class chap or a working-class woman, because that's sort of probably the way it's going to be. But when we, the Conservatives, have the Speaker, we sort of rather expect to have a gentleman. The idea of a lady didn't occur to him. We rather expect to have a gentleman in the chair. And the trouble with Burke, apart from anything else, is that he's, well, not to put too fine a point on it, he's an oik. 
So <laughs> that was his attitude. Well, I mean, this particular person is no longer in. But do you think Parliament, it really was that? But or? you know, he was a very dim-witted individual, and it's probably the best you know that he could manage. It was probably sort of the level of his understanding of politics and his attitude to people. You know, he was he was both snobbish and pretty thick. But do you think it was that? Was it that you? Do you think it was more that, or could it have been the fact that you were one of them, very much so, and then you deserted them, and that maybe they saw you as a traitor? Oh, and I that think that's that what well. they hated more than anything. Well, I think it's very difficult to say exactly which was, you know, a bigger factor. I think all of that is part of the mix. I totally accept that, Krishnan. I think that there has been some snobbery, without a doubt. I think there's been some anti-Semitism, and you are right. A lot of people stay pretty much in the same place politically and they are nervous about, suspicious of or even rank hostile towards people who don't do as they do. So of all the Prime Ministers since Thatcher, which one would you say you are now closest to politically? I find that hard I would to guess say. Tony Blair. I think that Tony Blair was the most successful Prime Minister. That is my view. I think Tony Blair was the most successful Prime Minister and, indeed, for that matter, in opposition party leader. You know, he had to be that first. Now, I didn't see that then, Krishnan, at the time that he was leading in opposition from 1994 to 1997. I was furiously opposed to him. I didn't see the attraction. I thought that the Conservatives should continue in government. Looking back, with the benefit of hindsight and looking back at those different leaders whom I found most impressive, I say without hesitation, I think Tony Blair was the most impressive Prime Minister. Of course, you know, he lives with the legacy of Iraq and is often criticised for that. I should say, by the way, I'm not here to defend Tony Blair and he doesn't need me to defend him. I've never felt that resentment of him on that subject. I suppose if you were persuaded by him to vote for the Iraq war on the basis of the presence of weapons of mass destruction which could be unleashed within 45 minutes, you might well feel resentful subsequently when it emerged, it transpired, that there were no such weapons. I didn't vote for the war for that reason. I voted for the war because of a decade of continued violation by Saddam Hussein of UN Security Council resolutions on the one hand and on account of his egregious abuse of human rights of his own people, including the use of chemical weapons against them. And I've never thought that Blair deliberately misled people. I've never believed that Tony Blair lied. The intelligence was flawed, but I still think it was the right decision. But more widely, I think that he undoubtedly was an extremely effective leader. But in other ways, I also admire Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown was not as successful as Prime Minister, partly because of the circumstances, partly perhaps he wasn't as well qualified to be Prime Minister as he hoped he would be or as Tony Blair had been. I still think he's an impressive guy. Uh, David Cameron, I think, is immensely capable. He's a very skillful performer. He was not as good in the chamber as Tony Blair, but he was a very, very, very accomplished, skillful, nimble-footed performer in the chamber, and he was also a very good platform speaker. I've always felt that David Cameron's weakness was that he was relentlessly tactical rather than strategic. You know, he flew by the seat of his pants. He tended to be buoyed by that innate, perhaps public school instilled self-confidence, and he tended to think that he would always win. I mean, you were very honest about sort of, uh, sort of your, your rather self-centred motives when you first came into politics. Oh, yes. When did you then discover a desire to change the world or to make the world a better place? When did you discover your vocation as a politician? Well, I think really it was only from about 2001 onwards. Now, I'm not proud of it, but I'm Why? just trying to be I mean, that, that's, that's four years into being an MP. I know. Well, no, I mean, I wanted in general terms the public good, Christian. Of course, but, I mean, but was, there, but the was there a good. thing? You know, but was there, there something wasn't that... really a theme to those first few years other than me trying to be an efficient and effective, hard-working, diligent local MP, and I did work hard throughout my 22 years in Parliament. But what caused me to change my mindset and start to think more widely about the great public interest and the need for change. I think it was really a couple of things. The first thing that made me think about change was the issue of gay equality. In 
either 1998 or 1999, I, in common with most Conservative MPs, had voted when the Labour government tried to bring about an equal age of consent for gays as compared with heterosexuals against that. I'd voted to retain the statutory differential so that gay people could have sex only at the age of 18 when heterosexuals could have sex at 16. But as I did so, I thought, I'm not sure that this is right. This is obviously what the great majority of Conservatives are doing, but it's not entirely obvious to me why there should be a statutory differential. And I think on that occasion, I heard two Conservative colleagues, Sean Woodward, who subsequently defected to the Labour Party, and Eleanor Lang, who is, of course, now Chairman of Ways and Means, a senior deputy speaker, arguing for equality at 16. I think if I remember rightly, they both spoke in one of the debates, and I was impressed by their speeches, but it was all too sudden for me. I hadn't given it enough thought, so I voted with most of my colleagues against change whilst being a bit uncomfortable about it. And I decided, well, I'll go away and think about this. And I spoke to some head teachers and to some church people in my constituency, and I said, look, is there any particular reason for this statutory differential? And again and again, really, the answer came back, well, not really, it's always been that way, but you know, it's more symbolic or totemic than of any practical value. And indeed, I started to think not only was it not of practical value, but it could be of practical danger and demerit, disadvantage, because if people didn't feel able to be open about their sexuality and to take advice to protect their health, to have safe sex and so on, you know, that was a real risk. So I resolved that I would vote for equality when the government next brought the matter back. The government was defeated principally in the House of Lords, I think, the first and possibly even the second time as well when it tried to change the law. That was one issue that caused me to start to think more progressively, more creatively, slightly more out of the Conservative box, if you will. The other issue was global poverty. I was appointed Shadow Secretary of State for International Development in November 2003 by Michael Howard, who had become leader, and I held that post for just under a year. And going to some of the most benighted parts of the world, war-torn, where people experienced the most egregious abuses of human rights, where maternal mortality was high, made me think about our responsibilities as a country to people less fortunate than us. And I ended up becoming very persuaded of the case for a sizable aid budget. And I felt that aid combined with freer trade and fairer trade, trade isn't fair, and debt relief could trigger a great improvement in the living standards of the poorest people on the face of the planet. And again, you know, it just made me a different person. Are you a very emotional man? I mean, it's, it's very interesting talking to you because, you, you know, talking about global poverty, you seem to well up. We've all seen you well up in the House of Commons and in other interviews about things. Um, and it just, it seems as though these things are very close to the surface. That's probably true. Yes, I think I am an emotional person. You know, sometimes it's thought to be risky in politics to admit that because there is this very traditional British attitude of stiff upper lip. But you've asked me a straight question, and wisely or unwisely, I've answered it. And the short answer is yes, I am quite an emotional person, and I do care about the plight of people who are less fortunate than I am. But do I think that it's a, a very important part of a politician's duty to try to promote social mobility? and to bring about greater equality, I do. I mean, I, it relates to what... I mean, I have to ask you about the allegations against you as well. Of course. Which is to course. do with your emotions. Now, there are a couple of people who have worked with you or for you or in the same environments as you who have made allegations about uh, either bullying or your general behaviour. Mm. You've denied these, mm. and we don't know all the details, so there's no point going into them. Now, but I mean, if you're emotional, have you got a temper as well, and do you think you're prone to being misunderstood? I don't think I'm prone to being misunderstood. I can occasionally become irascible, I can get annoyed from time to time. I don't think more so 
the very, very, very large numbers of people with whom I've worked over the years. If you ask me, you know, am I given to sort of regular rages or outbursts? Are you a shouter? Absolutely not. I'm not a shouter. No, I'm not in the business of ranting on a regular basis. No, I think I've got quite a loud voice. Am I an habitual shouter? Absolutely not. Am I regularly bad-tempered? Am I flying off the handle and staring at people and launching into great rages and so on? Absolutely not. I, th I think the point that I would want to make is this. I served as speaker for just over 10 years. I had two people in the speaker's office of the, I think, nine or 10 in the office who were with me from the start of my speakership until the end. And for the last eight and a half years of my speakership, they were in the same posts, speaker secretary and the assistant secretary. There were other people in that office who worked for me for seven years, for five years, for six years, etc in the Speaker's office and in my constituency office. I had very, very dedicated, committed, hard-working, loyal and supportive staff. I'm fundamentally a warm person, and I like people, and I'm appreciative of people who do their best and work hard and try to help me. So why do you think this is happening? Because, I mean, it's stopping you being in the House of Lords at the moment, isn't it, possibly? I mean, these allegations. Because well, normally you, you would be Lord Burko by now. Well, one could speculate as to why I've not been elevated to the House of Lords, and we'll have to see how that goes. I mean, I think there are a number of reasons why some people don't want me to go there. And I don't think, by any means, it's all due to the issue that we're now discussing. There are people who very strongly object to my handling of the Brexit process, for example. It has ordinarily happened, and we'll have to see. What is my answer to your specific point? The vast majority of people that I worked with in my time as Speaker were either very actively supportive of what I was trying to do to deliver reform, reform in the chamber, reform in the management of the parliamentary estate, reform in the development of the role of the speaker as an ambassador for parliament, visiting schools, colleges, universities, faith groups, voluntary organisations, public bodies and so on. Or they were people who may not have been natural enthusiasts for that, but who saw it as their role to back the speaker in his task. There was a small minority of people with whom I interacted in my decade as speaker who were much less sympathetic, who didn't support my agenda or didn't support important parts of it, and I had difficult relations with some of those people. Now, the fact that some of those working relationships weren't triumphant successes does not prove for one moment that there was any bullying or misconduct involved. A working relationship can fail simply because the objectives of the parties to that working relationship are not aligned. Or there is a personality clash and the people concerned just don't get on particularly well. Somebody recently said to me, John, I think if 70% of your working relationships, one's working relationships in the course of a career, go well, you're not doing badly. The great majority of mine have done. And the simple fact, which none of the detractors can gainsay, is that the vast majority of mine did. And when at various times the media have trawled and contacted people who used to work for me or friends of mine, they couldn't wait, those journalists, to get off the phone. They couldn't wait to get off the phone as soon as the person concerned said, oh yes, I remember working with John Burke very well, he was great to work with, he was fun, he was a good leader, or we were very close colleagues and we had very warm relations or whatever. They weren't interested in that, of course. What they wanted to do, what they've always wanted to do, is to find someone who would say the opposite. And yes, there have been people who have said the opposite. I deal with that matter in the book. I very explicitly say in the book that there were a couple of people whom it was being bruited were claiming to be bullied. Uh, one has never said so in public and the other has said so in public. And in each case, I deal in the book with those relationships and I explain what did happen and what didn't. 
In one case, it was a very straightforward case of reform versus tradition, reform versus tradition, reform versus tradition. I wanted to change things. That person didn't want to do so. And on issue after issue after issue, try as I did and work at that relationship as I did for 12 months, it didn't work because I wanted to proceed in one direction and that person, perfectly dedicated public servant, had not adjusted to the fact of me being the speaker. Other people in the office had adjusted and were doing so very successfully. That person hadn't adjusted. And in the end, I said to that person, look, I'm sorry because you've worked very hard and I appreciate your commitment, but I'm afraid we are just too different and our approaches don't gel and I would like to make a change. And at the time, the person concerned, and I remember exactly where we were sitting in the office when I conducted this obviously painful and disagreeable conversation with him, leant forward, gave me his hand to shake hands and said, I quite understand, Mr. Speaker. Now, several years later, that person came forward and said, oh, well, he felt that he'd been ill-treated. Well, I can say only that that's what he said at the time, and I don't think he was ill-treated in any way, shape or form. There were honest and honourable differences of opinion. In relation to the other person, well, no such claim has ever been publicly made, but it is suggested that there is an idea that another person was badly treated by me. Well, I can say only that there was another person, yes, who left the office, and that person left of her own volition. And the simple fact is, as several witnesses will testify, that individual did have ideas about how to run the office, which she was perfectly entitled to have. But I didn't buy into those ideas. And I said, I'm sorry, but I've decided I don't want to make those changes. I'm in favor of change, but I'm not in favor of change for the sake of change. And in fact, I steadfastly defended the jobs of two people in that office who were extremely capable and utterly loyal and who remained with me for the duration. So there were two people who left the Speaker's office in circumstances that have subsequently caused comment about bullying and in one case an explicit allegation of it. The first was somebody that I inherited, I didn't appoint, but I did my best to work with that person. The second was appointed by a panel chaired by a senior clerk, which I should never have allowed to happen. I was stupid about it. I allowed myself to be persuaded that it wasn't something I needed to do myself to appoint a new secretary. Oh, no, Mr. Speaker, you don't need to appoint your secretary. You can cause an appointment to be made. The proper course would be to allow a panel chaired by a clerk to proceed with the selection process. And a person was selected and we worked together for a period and it became apparent that that person had a particular view about how the office should be restructured, which involved getting rid of some very dedicated and long-serving staff who in the end served me right till the end. And I, having reflected on it, said, no, I don't want that. And a small number of months later, after a period in which we carried on working together, but not especially successfully, that person chose to leave the office. What that shows is that two working relationships didn't work. What that does not show is that there was anything in any way, shape or form by way of bullying. And I will maintain until my dying day, because it has the advantage of being true, that I have never bullied anyone anywhere at any time. I was elected as a reformer. I had a democratic mandate to try to deliver reform. And in some cases, fortunately in a minority of cases, I came across people who were very institutionalized, very committed to their own view, and quite convinced that the proper course was for them not just to have their say, but to have their way. And when I said, well, no, I'm sorry, I don't want it done like that, I want it done differently, they didn't like that. You've talked about all the things you did as Speaker uh, to increase scrutiny, to strengthen the role of backbench MPs. Um, But I I wonder also if you will be known for having actually allowed Parliament 
to take over the job of government, uh, in allowing MPs to take over the order paper, which is what happened right at the end of the whole Brexit row. Yeah. What do you think is the constitutional significance of that in the long term? Whether it will have a long-term constitutional significance, Krishnan, I genuinely don't know, and I think it's too early to say. My attitude was, we are in unprecedented times. And so my feeling was, we've got to reckon with the new reality. This is a minority government. And I do not believe that I breached any standing order in the decisions I made. I accept that standing order 24, which allows for emergency debates with some level of support for the idea in the chamber and the agreement of the speaker, were never intended to bring about changes in the law. But very importantly, Standing Order 24 did not preclude that possibility. It did not prohibit it. It did not rule it out. It was not off limits. I did from time to time take decisions which involved disregarding or weighing up and then rejecting the advice of the clerks because advisers advise and decision makers decide. And in the end, the chair has to take responsibility. So I now and again did listen to the advice of the clerks, but then decide to do things differently. That's true. But in relation to the Ben Act, which said in terms, there will not be a no deal Brexit, there will not be a straightforward crash out of the European Union for the UK unless Parliament explicitly authorises it, in allowing that to happen, I was simply taking the attitude, let's see what Parliament wants. And as the Speaker is supposed to be the servant of the House, it seems to me that I was doing the right thing and I have never had any regrets about it. I would do the same again. Well, it, it may be one way in which you changed the British Constitution, at the very least. Um, our final question is always, if you could just wave a magic wand and change the world, what would you do? I'd ensure that no child was left hungry. I think in a world of plenty, the fact that there are children all around the world who go hungry, who are malnourished, and who in many cases end up, as a result, suffering disease and early death, that is a tragedy, and it's an avoidable tragedy. John Burke, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. For sharing your ways to change the world and talking a little bit about your, your remarkable story. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.